Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, our uh, astroparticle seminar. Uh, today we have Jose Alonso uh, Carpio with us. He's a, a graduate student from Penn State uh, and supervised by Kota Mavase. And despite the fact that he is only, only a graduate student, he has already published a long list of papers with, uh, on different subjects. So I saw uh, he's interested in correlations of high energy neutrinos with ultra high energy cosmic rays and how magnetic fields in our galaxy can affect this correlation. And he has also been working on charmed meson production, charmed baryon production, astrophysical sources. Uh, so what this contribution can look like on Earth and uh, he's also very interested in uh, non-standard interactions of neutrinos or in general, how we can probe secret neutrino interactions with the cosmic neutrino background and also with dark matter with the help of neutrino telescope. And I think today we will hear, hear about these secret uh, neutrino interactions from me. So uh, Jose, we're happy to have you with us and uh, whenever you are ready. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me. So, and giving the opportunity to give, to give this talk. Now, what I will discuss here constitutes a part of my thesis project, and this will be uh, a study of the neutrino time, time delay. I'll explain what this phenomenon is and how we can use this to investigate uh, beyond center model interactions in the neutrino sector. And this is the work that I've been doing with my advisor, Kota, and also with Ali Karandish. <clears throat> So to get started, uh, why should we care about uh, neutri neutrinos? So the, fir the first point is that the, neutri the neutrino neutrinos are covering quite a big order of magnitude between several sources. Uh, so for the ones that I will be uh, discussing in this talk, uh, it's first the cosmological neutrinos, which are on the very low energy low energy end, microelectron volts to millielectron volts. And this constitutes the uh, neutrino counterparts to the cosmic microwave background. On top of that, I will also be using uh, the supernova neutrinos, which are in the MEV, MEV range, and then the astrophysical neutrinos, which cover from, start from 100 GeV and then all the way up to 10, tens of PVs. Now this, this curve is just representative for an AGN model, model, but there are so many astrophysical pheno phenomena, GRBs, magnetars, and others. So, and the, each one has can have different uh, spectral features. So just, you can just take this as a very rough representative of how it would look. Now neutrinos will only interact through the weak force in the standard model. So that provides a series of advantages since it does not interact uh, electromagnetically, then these neutrinos are never deflected by magnetic fields. So just like the photons, astrophysical neutrinos can point towards the source. On top of that, uh, unlike photons, which can be stopped by electron interactions, the neutrino uh, has a much smaller cross-section. They're not that easily absorbed inside the source, which also means that we can probe deeper into progenitors, which is one of the uh, attractive points about neutrinos. Now, in more recent years, we also found that the neutrino, which was originally believed to be massless, uh, now has mass, and this requires the beyond standard model physics explanation. Now, to understand how I'm going to introduce beyond standard model interactions, we just briefly, briefly review what happens in the actual standard model. So, the usual picture is we have three electron generations, electron, muon, and tau. And each one of these charged leptons has its uh, corresponding char uh, chargeless, massless neutrino. And between these six particles, each one has uh, a corresponding antiparticle. When it comes to the neutrino interactions in the standard model, there are two ways in which this can happen. You can have the neutrino coupling to its charged lepton via what we call charge current interaction, which is the exchange of the W boson, or you can have neutrinos interacting with neutrinos of the same flavor by the exchange of the Z boson. 
and these are the two interactions via the weak force. When it comes to this kind of coupling, the neutrino can either be a Dirac particle, which has a distinction between the neutrino and the antineutrino, or it can be a Majorana particle, where the neutrino is its own antiparticle. The standard model doesn't have a way to discriminate between these, between these two because they would interact uh, with the same kind of cross-section. And the second relevant point is that in the standard model, neutrinos are massless by construction. And this comes from the particle physics point that neutrinos are built as left-handed leptons in the standard model. And to acquire mass in the usual way, you will need a right-handed neutrino, which does not exist in this framework. And we'll see how uh, we can do this later. Now, uh, the way it was found that neutrinos have mass is by studying the solar neutrinos. So we have a pretty good model of how nuclear processes in the sun produce the electron neutrinos. But when it, we came, when it came down to actually measuring this flux, there was a flux deficit on Earth compared to the actual expectation. Now, after several measurements, and these were led by Super K and, and Snow, it was found that the electron neutrinos are actually changing to other neutrino flavors and covers and allows it to cover the, def the deficit in new efflux if you consider the other flavors. And this can be uh, readily explained by the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. And neutrino oscillations work by assuming in the quantum mechanical sense that the neutrino flavor eigenstates are different from the mass eigenstates which have a definite mass. And in terms of neutrino oscillations, the formulas only provide us with information about the difference in the squared masses. So this is good in the sense that it tells us that the neutrinos need to have mass, but we don't know exactly which masses they must, each eigenstate has. Uh, the best we do have at the moment is the cosmological constraint, which tells us that uh, between the three active neutrino states, the maximum mass that all of them can have is around 0.1 eV. So they are very, very light compared to the charged leptons and the other members of the standard, or the other massive members of the standard mod model. Just like the, stand the standard model, uh, neutrino oscillations does not, is not able to distinguish between Dirac or Majorana particles in its uh, simplest form. And that's what that's also gives rise to a couple of other unanswered questions, even after considering the existence of neutrino oscillations. So, as I mentioned before, we don't know whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. This is investigated uh, by running the neutrinoless double beta decay experiment. And if this kind of emission is detected, that would be evidence that neutrinos are Majorana particles. Uh, how do neutrino, neutrinos acquire mass? We do have a framework, which is the CISO mechanism. It's one of the two alternatives. Uh, but even with this method of generating neutrino mass, we still need some other beyond standard model physics uh, intera interaction or model that tells us where, where the extra right-handed neutrino is coming from, which allows the CISO mechanism to work. In the neutrino oscillation front, we also have the reactor anomalies, which is uh, discrepancies in the neutrino flux from reactor experiments compared to the uh, results from other experiments and the standard neutrino oscillation flame, uh, framework. And this also motivates the possibility that there are other neutrino flavors, which we call sterile neutrinos. And this can also change the way in which we treat neutrino oscillations. And the sterile neutrino in particular is, a, is one of the possible uh, dark matter candidates in, and specifically the KEV sterile neutrino is one of the uh, candidates that are commonly used in literature. So having discussed uh, standard mod, neutrinos in the standard model and neutrino oscillations, then comes the question of how I'm going to introduce new physics. So there are several ways in which I can extend a standard model. 
and involving neutrinos. I'm going to add new interactions with the, um, with the feature that neutrinos will only couple to other neutrinos or to dark matter. And the reason we're choosing this kind of interaction is because it allows us to avo avoid very uh, stringent constraints that are coming from lab, lab measurements, which is uh, rare, rare decays in, in which k, k ons and the Z boson can decay into other particles. So by choosing couplings to these sectors alone, we reduce the number of constraints we're facing when building a model of this sort. On the left-hand side, we have what we call the neutrino self-interactions. And in this case, you have the, ve the vector or scalar mediator that is going to get this exchange. This is a, gener a generic case. So I'm not putting any specific La Lagrangian or higher model, higher energy theory attached to it. And on the right-hand side, we have neutrinos coupling to dark matter. And uh, those that are familiar with particle physics, you'll see that I'm specifically choosing a way in which uh, the mediator just connects the neutrino sector to the dark matter sector. I'm not considering the possibility that within one vector, uh, one vertex, I'm coupling neutrino and dark matter together. Um, and now these kinds of models are actually very well motivated. Uh, Self-interactions are used when trying to alleviate, but not solve, the Hubble tension, as this can affect the way in which the cosmic neutrino background is going to be, or well, uh, the, plas the plasma, which then becomes the cosmic neutrino background, is going to evolve over time in the early universe. Uh, the new vector, considering a new vector mediator for the neutrinos, is also used to explain the muon anomalous magnetic moment, which is a pretty hot topic as, as of the recent Fermilab uh, announcement. Um, as I mentioned before, with these kinds of interactions, you can also produce KV sterile neutrino dark matter if one of these uh, neutrinos is actually, actually a sterile state. So it can happen. Uh, one of the risks of the other features that we can have is that with these interactions, we can halt supernova explosions and prevent uh, shock, re shock revival. So this is one of the ways in which you can constrain these kind of models. And when it comes to neutrino dark matter interactions, uh, a Lagrangian that allows for this kind of process also allows the production of sub MeV fermionic dark matter. So this is also another uh, interesting way in which we can get dark, dark matter candidates. <clears throat> now then, uh, having discussed this, we now move on to what I mean by the neutrino echo or neutrino time delay. And the way this works is you Can people still hear me? Okay, I think it must be on Jose's side. Maybe it's my connection. Yeah. We can hear you. Okay, Jose, uh, can you hear us? Uh, your screen is frozen at the moment. Aye, aye, aye. Ah, uh, there he goes. Okay, I'll stop recording. Uh, uh, so can you still hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, so as the astrophysical neutrinos propagate, uh, they're going to be colliding with the cosmic neutrino background or dark matter. Now, in this case, if a scattering occurs, then the neutrino is going to be deflected. If this deflection takes place, then you're going to go through a longer trajectory to get to Earth. And from this longer trajectory, there's going to be some delay with respect to say the primary photon that goes straight to Earth or an unscattered neutrino. Now, the way in which I'm going to do this, uh, this kind of calculation for the delay is I'll be working in the small angle scattering approximation. This is uh, 
this actually co still covers a very large uh, range of possible interactions because given the energies that we're going to be using, it's very easy to get models where, where uh, typical scattering is much less than one radian. And in this case, uh, these two uh, references have used the small angle scattering approximation for time delay in the context of X-ray scattering. And it's easy to apply this for the neutrino case. And well, what they found is that under this approximation, the time delay can be given by this formula. Now, these alpha and betas, they're not your typical cylindrical coordinate angles. These are just angles uh, given by the projection in the X1, X3 plane, X2, X3 plane. And I want to point out that this formula is from purely geometrical arguments. It does not require any input on the actual uh, interaction model. The interaction model is just going to tell me how these angles are going to be changing over time. Now, to get the actual distribution for T that from an analytical uh, perspective is actually very complicated, if not impossible. So the, the main way in which we're going to do this is through numerical simulations. Now, I'm going to do this through the Monte Carlo approach with a code that I have developed uh, from scratch. And within Monte Carlo simulation, it's pretty easy to try to compute this kind of uh, integral just because the only times that these angles are changing is when a scattering takes place in a Monte Carlo in the Monte Carlo framework. And this gives a very easy way to discretize this integral in steps covered between successive scatterings. The other way in which you could solve this is by solving the full transport equation. And in that case, you can encounter uh, several, pro several problems because the transport equation covers the, is a differential equation with the four dimensions in for space time and the four dimensions for uh, energy and, mom and momentum. So in that case, it's very easy for uh, the transport equation to become very computationally intensive, which is why I'm taking the Monte Carlo approach. So to understand how I'm going to uh, show some of my results, I'm, I need to know when scatterings occur in the Monte Carlo simulation. And the way you do it is you start off with some neutrino going through a target. For starters, I'm going to consider the cosmic neutrino background. Of course, you can extend this to a dark matter target. There's no real difference in how to do this uh, setup. And if you go through a distance D, you can define the optical depth, which is this integral of the target density times the cross section throughout the length of the target. And with the optical depth, you have a clear expression of the interaction probability of a scat or the probability for a scattering to occur after traversing a certain optical depth. And from this, that's when uh, just by computing this, which requires a cross section, I can then get the interaction probability and that lets the Monte Carlo begin. Now, in the special case where your target has some uniform density and there's a constant cross section, an easy way to define the optical depth is just by the ratio of the propagation length divided by the mean free path. And this is the way in which you can then split the, the regimes of, of these interactions into two. You have on the one hand, the case where the optical depth is really, really low. And that's when the propagation length is much smaller than the mean free path. And in that case, most, if any, neutrinos are going to scatter, you will get at most one scattering. On the other hand, if the optical depth is really large, then you should expect several scatterings to take, to take place. And we call that the optically thick regime. And I'm going to use these two separate uh, scenarios to set up the main examples, uh, which are going to be used as kind of a, a test of the Monte Carlo simulation code. <clears throat> so in this case, I still need to provide a model. So I'm going to start off with this model and that's just because of its simplicity in implementation and it's the neut neutrino self-interactions with a scalar mediator. 
so in this case, what I have is an interaction Lagrangian of this sort, where I'm coupling the two neutrinos with the scalar. And to avoid um, the complexities of dealing with the Dirac neutrino, I'm going to focus just on the Majorana neutrinos. And to uh, remove the neutrino oscillation part for now, I'm going to consider only one neutrino flavor. Under this model, the angular distribution has a very simple analyt analytical expression. The only part that the most relevant part here, and which I want to point my attention to, is this term because for astrophysical neutrinos, which are in the TV range, this ratio with the neutrino mass being less than electron volt, this ratio is actually pretty large, which in turn means that this term is going to be pretty small. And therefore, the angles theta are going to be tiny. So we're expecting theta, at least for this kind of test, to be in the 10 to the minus 7 uh, range. And this is important because that means that the small angle scattering approximation is going to work perfectly fine. Uh, from this model, we can get the, the cross section. And this is what I'm plotting here. Well, not the cross section itself. I'm plotting the mean free path. And the most important feature here is that with this kind of interaction, where neutrinos are going to be interacting through what we call the S-channel scattering, you can have a resonant production of your scalar particle. When you undergo resonant production, the cross-section is going to spike, and we get this kind of, fe this kind of feature, where you see that the mean free path is going to suddenly de decrease at a very specific energy, which amounts to this term becoming zero. For our benchmark model, we're assuming the neutrino mass fixed to 0.1 eV and the mediator mass to be at 10 MeV. So that gives us the 500 TeV resonance. And you can see that for a lot of, at least for this very strong coupling of 0.5, essentially the mean free path over a very wide number of energy scales uh, of sorry, over many energy decades, is actually significantly smaller than uh, typical propagation lengths for, the so for astrophysical sources. So in that case, this, this coupling is an optically thick regime, while for the smallest coupling of 0.01, you're pretty much in the optically thin regime because outside of that resonance, the mean free path is going to be typically much larger than any relevant propagation length. So we're going to be using this coupling to sort of separate the one, scat the one scattering approximation and the case where you have several scatterings taking place at once. And the reason we're going to be choosing 10 MeV scalar mediators is because given the current constraints, and this is a plot from uh, a paper by Mauricio and collaborators, which some of you might, may or may not be in this talk and want, uh, as well. Uh, the 10 MeV mediator is provides a resonance at 500 TeV. And well, same happens for new, uh, mediator masses in this kind of mass range. So it's a perfect uh, energy for you to see something in ice, in ice cube. Uh, now, the other thing is that on top of the kinds of ice cube constraints that you can get for mediators, which can be above a few MeV and up to a few tens of MeVs. You also have uh, the lab constraints, which come from uh, rare, de rare decays of the scalar mediator into neutrinos. And these are pretty well constrained. And that's also the reason why for most of the, the models that I'm going to show, once we use multiple flavors, I'm going to be focusing on coupling to the tau sector only. And that's pretty clear why given this plot, because it's the one that is the least constrained and gives me uh, more parameter space to, to probe. <clears throat> so now we move on to the simulations that I can get in this Monte Carlo setup. So for starters, I'll just pick uh, 170 TV neutrinos. I'm picking this coupling of G just so that I can get a mean free path that's in the ballpark of one gigaparsec. <clears throat> And from there, I just start varying the propagation lengths, which correspond to different optical depths. 
and 10 to the minus three, that's still the small optical depth limit, and all the way up to one. The histograms are the results of the Monte Carlo simulation, and the solid curves are the result of the, or is the result of using the analytical formulas for the time delay. So from here, we can see that the Monte Carlo uh, code actually does a pretty good job at, uh, at uh, recreating the analytical formulas. And this works perfectly fine all the way up to around optical depth of 0.1. Once you hit this spot at larger optical depths, the probability of getting more and more scatterings uh, starts to increase. And of course, if more scatterings take place, then you expect the angular spread of these scattered neutrinos to increase. And the more they spread, the larger the expected time delay. So this is uh, the kind of mentality that you should have as I show these examples, which is every time you think that the angle scattering, the scattering angle increases, you should expect longer delays. And then here with these dashed lines, we have uh, the typical characteristic time delay that you should expect on the small angle scattering approximation. So then we also see that uh, while we can, we can get very close to the peak using this characteristic delay, uh, you're also missing out on quite, quite a bit of the full distribution profile. And this is very relevant when you start doing a, an analysis an actual analysis with data because you will need the full this time delay distribution to get uh, a more rigorous result. So having covered the small optical depth limit, we now go to the optically thick limit. And in this case, we're going to use the regime where there is no energy loss. So we define this inelasticity par parameter which is the ratio of the scatter neutrino energy versus the incident neutrino energy. So if we assume that there is no energy loss, then that also means that you're not upscattering that cosmic neutrino background. Uh, so in this case, it's just one neutrino that just keeps bouncing off the background without losing any energy. And in this setup, we assume 300 TV neutrinos, with a moderately large coupling, which is the optically thick limit. And in that case, your mean free path is at around 10 to the 24 centimeters. So it's uh, close to the one to the one megaparsec mark. Um, now, once we get to this limit, there is an, an, analytical solu an analytical solution, which is given by this blue curve. But you can see that the Monte Carlo simulation and the analytical formula are actually very, uh, separ very separated. So we're, for this kind of result, I'm just using the propagation length of 100 megaparsecs. So the optical depth is around 300. The analytical formula will typically will predict uh, an exponential decay in the delay distribution at large t. And this does not happen for the Monte Carlo simulation where the, uh, pro the probability density actually scales as t to the minus two, or in this case, t times the density scales as t to the minus one. The peak predicted by the Monte Carlo is more at the 1000 second range, while the, the actual analytical expectation is that it should not, you should not get the peak uh, above a couple of around uh, 50 seconds. So there is a huge discrepancy. The reason why this is happening is because the derivation for the analytical expression assumes that your angular distributions decay sufficiently fast at large angles. So this works very well if you were, assume that you, you were to assume that your distribution follows a Gaussian, but this uh, neutrino, neutrino model that we're using does not follow a, Ga a Gaussian, and this creates a huge discrepancy. Uh, if you were to include the process of energy loss, then this curve would actually shift closer to, to shorter time delays. So you can see that including energy loss, in which case 
you're allowing for neutrinos to lose energy, you get also very different curves if there are multiple scatterings taking place. And the reason for that is because as neutrinos lose energy, they can start moving out of the resonance window where the mean free path is actually quite small. So you start off with a 300 TV neutrino, the mean free path is very short. You get one scattering, you lose energy, the mean free path increases, uh, interaction probability decreases, and the chances of multiple scatterings to accumulate starts to get smaller and smaller. So in that case, you get less scatterings, so shorter delays. And this one is uh, gives you the information that, that you need because it tells you there is a very big uh, importance in the fact that neutrinos can lose energy in transit. And it's hugely important when it comes to resonance interactions. So these are the, so these two examples are the most basic tests. So uh, I think I would like to stop here to see if there is any questions up to this point before I move on to them. Uh, yeah, are there any questions? I see Victor has his hand up. Victor, is your mic working? I don't hear you, Victor. Maybe uh, Shashank, uh, maybe if you go first and then Victor might try. Uh, yeah, so my uh, question is, uh, so if you have a delay, uh, how do you know that the neutrino we are seeing is a delayed neutrino from the source or some other source altogether? So my question is like, if we see a, one neutrino from these kind of uh, uh, sources, which are very far away, how do we know that the neutrino is from that particular source? That of course depends on the angular resolution, right? So are you assuming some kind of an angular resolution in your simulation? So for this, for this one, uh, I'm not assuming any sort of angular distribution. I'm just assuming a point source emi emitting, a, well, actually there, there is a slight angular distribution. And uh, so, sorry, I, I was not talking about the angular distribution. I was talking about the angular resolution of the yeah. detector where the neutrino is detected. Yeah, so at this point, I am not using a, uh, de a detector. So I'm under an idealized scenario where you will have some source, some source where the angular spread of the of the emission, or by default the, or on the other hand, that resolution of the detector can cover at least the order of ten to the minus ten to the minus seven uh, angular spread that you're expecting from this from the scatterings. Uh, I, once I move on to the second part of the talk, I will discuss uh, how you're going to cover this kind of um, this kind of angular of angular resolution when it comes down to uh, wh whether I'm identifying this specific source. Um, so yeah, but at this point, since you're expecting uh, the typical angular spread of this kind of inter of interaction is going to be so so tiny, uh, the, on, the only way it can be from, an, from another source uh, is if it's actually in the exact same direction as the, as the one that is emitting this delayed signal. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, well, uh, not really, because uh, let us, uh, for sake of simplicity, say that the the detector in which we detect the neutrino mm -hmm. has an angular resolution of 20 degrees. Okay. Then we just see a neutrino coming from a circle which is 20 degrees in diameter. Now, it will be very difficult for me to know whether a neutrino I see was one hour uh, arrived one hour later from a source from which presumably I saw another electromagnetic signal mm -hmm. or something of that sort or gravitational wave or something mm -hmm. or just by chance there happens to be another source within that 20 degree uh, diameter circle on the other hand if my detector has an angular resolution of 
two arc seconds, then I can very confidently say that the neutrino came from that same source, right? So mm -hmm. the question of angular resolution of the detector is quite different from the question of the angular spread, which happens due to the scattering, right? Mm -hmm. So my question was about the angular resolution of the detector and not the spread of the neutrino flux due to the scattering. Okay. Yeah. So if we're work, we're talking about a about the detector itse itself, then we are working on the ideal scenario that either you have a detector that has a very tiny res resolution while at the same time getting a sufficient number of events, or what is I'm going to uh, discuss in the case of the supernova neutrinos is that even if the if the angular resolution of the of the detector is pretty large, the kind of events that you, or the kind of astrophysical phenomena you're looking for are sufficiently rare so that you, so that you are more confident in whether your delayed neutrino is coming from that source. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So Victor had his hand up earlier. I, do yeah. you want to try? Victor, can you say? Ah, he's uh, sending. Can you see the chat, uh, Jose? I can also read it out. Uh, thanks for this good summary of the paper. Are the time delay PDFs averaged over all the possible arrival angular deviations as seen by the detector? Uh, or is it for a fixed one? Also, how large is this expected deviation in the arrival direction? Okay. Also, I guess this would apply only in the scenario. Okay, so for this specific model that I'm using, the, these PDFs are added up over all possible angular de deviations. So since the scattering angles are, are at the 10 to the minus, se 10 to the minus seven level, it will, it's uh, very, very hard for, for several kinds of detectors to get to the precision where this spread in the arrival direction is going to actually matter. So most of the cases they will be in the, they will definitely look like they're coming specifically from this source. Yeah, so Victor sends uh, reply yeah. here also, I guess this would apply only in the scenario of a transient short enough for the time delay to be meaningful. Uh, thanks a lot. Exactly, so this is also the important part. We're looking for some transient that is far away and will last in this case a few seconds to get to the to this sig delayed signal is going to be very well separated from the initial burst. This is also a point I'm going to touch on when dealing with the supernova neutrinos. So yeah, thank you. Uh, so Damiano, I see your hand is up. Do you have a short question in the interest of time? Yes, indeed, it's very short. Uh, so thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my question was about the cross section that you were assuming. So I gathered that this was a kind of uh, S resonance cross section, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so my question was: so with my running neutrinos, shouldn't you also have interference with the T channel resonance? Correct. Uh, so in this case, the interference with the T channel resonance uh, will affect these uh, these tails away from the resonant region. And as long as we're getting the cup decoupling at around the 0.1 level for the propagation lens that I'm going to discuss, the T channel uh, does not significantly affect the, the results that we're going to be getting. And that's only because the T channel is uh, much, has a much smaller cross section than S channel, at least in, Presence we knew. Yeah, so the point is that uh, it is negligible, but only if you are very close to the resonance energy. Yes. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Okay, yeah. I, th I think, Jose, you can continue with your talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe we have 20 minutes or so left to give you yeah. some idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, if we move, move on to a more complex example, we can assume a source that is at a redshift z equals one and injects an e to the minus two spectrum. This is the typical uh, kind of scenario you have for a, an ideal 
a neutrino source. So in this case, I can show distributions that you can get for optically thin regime, uh, optical depth that is of about a few, and an optical depth that corresponds to the optically thick case. So then when it comes to the spectrums, you can see to the spectra, you can see that you do get a lot of, uh, of downscattering part particles. So as you keep increasing the optical depth, as you build up more and more scatterings, and this also causes the delay distributions to start shifting to longer and longer delays. I've also shown that this case, which is a non-physical one, but it's useful to highlight the effect of red, redshift loss and how this makes neutrinos enter the resonance region through adiabatic losses, then scatter, and then enter the optically thin regime. So this kind of, um, let's call it this kind of help that the neutrinos get to enter resonance through redshift losses is mo most of the time causes a slight deviation in what you're expecting from your uh, delay, delay distributions, uh, but they're not particularly major. The important part when dealing with this kind of study is that your delays are always going to be cut off if you impose an energy threshold. This is relevant for pretty much any experiment you're going to be dealing with because most of them has a minimum energy that you're getting. If you're cutting the, the energy, then that means there is a maximum possible scattering angle for a neutrino. So in that case, that also causes a cut in the delay distribution. This has to be accounted for whenever you make some kind of analysis. So in this case, you depending on the coupling that you're getting, your delays can be at redshift C equals one, can be from a, a few seconds all the way up to a thousand seconds, depending on coupling, which is related to number of scatterings. If you then go to an even more realistic case and you consider three neutrino flavors, then the picture doesn't change too much either. So as I mentioned before, uh, the preferred kind of coupling in the three neutrino scenario is through with a tau sector only. And I'm choosing the coupling to be at 0.05, which is, uh, which just amounts to a few scatterings. And then I just pick some uh, model parameters so that I can get the resonance where I want it at, in the ice cube range close to 500 TeV and without violating the cosmological bounds on neutrino mass. So in this case, now that you have two masses that, or sorry, three masses where two of them are very close together by oscillation measurements, then you get two resonance dips in the energy spectrum. And then you see that due to the neutrino mixing all of the eigenstates, then all the time delays are pretty similar to each other. The only difference is on the low delay end. And the reason for that is because these ones have actually had smaller scatterings taking place. And this part is related to how neutrinos, the tau neutrino is, uh, or this related to the specific mass eigenstate superposition of the tau neutrino. And this also is dependent on the neutrino ma mixing matrix elements. And in that case, if there's only one scattering taking place, that mixing actually ends up favoring slight conversion uh, to electron neutrinos over the other ones. So this part is going to is good for us because then that means that when we get us we get a signal, uh, we might not need to care too much about what's the actual neutrino flavor of the delayed uh, emission. So now the how are we're going to do this in a in an analysis that's now when we're going to be focusing on supernova neutrino emission. So for supernova neutrinos, these cover the MEV range. And I'm going to assume a spectrum that takes this kind of form, which is you have uh, some power law e to the alpha together with an exponential decay with some pinching parameter. So here I'm just showing the kind of distributions you're expecting for a bunch of different parameters. So the benchmark that we're going to choose is this orange curve, 
which has the peak slightly above uh, 10 MeV. And we're going to be tuning the, uh, the, luminos the total energy that is being emitted to five times 10 to the 52 ergs. So this is slightly on the, on the, optimist on the optimistic side. And we're also going to be dis discussing on what this duration time is going to be and how it's going to compare to the delays that we're expecting. Now, when it comes to this case, since we're going for supernovas, we're going to be aiming at 10 kiloparsec supernova, supernovae, and we're going to be relying in neutrino dark matter interactions. Now, in this case, for dark matter, the self interact we have the lambda CDM model that is very successful explaining large scale, large scale structures, but there are a couple of problems at the small scale. So there's the list, which is a core cost problem, diversity problem, missing satellites and too big to fail problem. And these motivate the possibility that there are some dark matter, dark matter self interactions taking place. And for these kind of self interactions, we're going to be also adding the possibility of coupling to neutrinos. And in that case, we have three different models that we're going to be choosing from. We have fermionic dark matter, an exchange with a vector mediator or a scalar mediator. And then we also have the case of scalar dark matter. And this one is motivated mostly through, um, through Higgs portal dark matter models. And since the, scale, the dark matter is assumed to be a scalar, you also need some energy scale in this case. So we're fixing it to 100 GeV, which is motivated by the fact that some models are relying on, uh, the, on the Higgs vacuum expectation value for the traditional model of Higgs portal. <clears throat> uh, in this case, since our interactions are going to be through the T channel rather than S channel, we're not going to have any sort of resonance scattering. So in this case, cross sections are going to be more well behaved. They won't have sudden jumps. And since we're also going to be including dark matter compared to only self, uh, neutrino self interactions, we also have constraints that are coming from the dark matter sector. And the most prominent one that we're going to be discuss, uh, using in, in the constraints that I'm going to show is the merging cluster constraints, which just tells you that the cross section of dark matter self scattering divided by its mass has to be less than 0.1 centimeters squared per gram. So this one is one, the, one of the tighter bounds because it can go from 0.1 to one, depending on what's the sample that you're using to derive this kind of constraint. Now, when it comes to the delayed supernova neutrino signal, since the source is nearby, the propagation length is small, and we have a local dark matter density, which we assume constant of 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube, we're still in the optically thin limit. And for the different models that we're using, we see that these delays are actually pretty large. The reason for that is because unlike the previous example where the energies of the neutrino are above TVs, several hundred TVs, these ones are in the MeV range. And we're covering uh, dark matter and mediator masses that are relatively uh, small or are actually close to being comparable to neutrino energy. So scatterings are expected to be large, even if the propagation is, is small. And the vector mediator is one of the better ones because this one typically has a much, uh, small, much smaller scattering angles. So they predict shorter delays. So the, the way we're going to deal with these delays, uh, we're going to be discussing soon. So in terms of hyper K, in this case, we're going the supernova neutrino emission, which is uh, anti-electron neutrinos. They're going to interact through inverse beta decay in a, in a detector, which is basically going to be water in this case, and then produce a number of events. The important point here is that we're using the energy threshold of 10, of 10 MeV for, for this kind of inverse beta decay process. And as I mentioned before, energy threshold becomes important when cutting your delay distributions. And from there, you can, with this formula, we get that for the typical uh, scenario that we're going to be using, which is this orange curve, we should expect 
uh, around 40,000 neutrinos, neutrino events. In the optically thin limit, since very few neutrinos scatter, we need this kind of high statistics so that you can get a couple of thousand of neutrino events in the delayed signal. And this is going to help us to derive our constraints. Now, regarding one of the previous questions, we're using the duration of the, of the emission to be at 1.5 seconds, which is pretty much significantly smaller to the delays that we're expecting in, in this signal, which is order of 10 to the seven neutrinos. And in this case, what we're just going to do is we're going to try and gather the scattered neutrinos above 10 MeV, in which case we're enforcing the, the threshold. And we're trying to cover 50% of the signal since the initial burst within some time window. Uh, we're using this background event of 7.29 events every thousand seconds for hyper K. And from there, we see that for small mediator masses, you don't, the, your delay is actually very, very small. And as you start looking for heavier, heavier mediators, the delay continues to increase. So this is the part where, which is relatively dangerous, which is when you start approaching the one MeV mass because then the delays is several years or longer. So that's not, a, not ideal in most cases. And then since the cross-section depends on two different couplings, on dark matter coupling and neutrino coupling, when we derive the constraints, we're just, just going to use this effective coupling, which is the square root of these, of these two. <clears throat> And this also gives us some, uh, some way in which we can uh, play around with these couplings as we try to get our constraints on either neutrino self-interactions or dark matter self-interactions. Now, in the case of fermion dark matter with a vector mediator, uh, we see that if you, your mediator is way too light, then your delays are comparable to the duration of the burst. So we, we cannot use these ones to derive constraints. But then for mediators that are coming at one MeV and above, we, we can. And in that case, we can get pretty good constraints. So for these ones where the delays are expected to be 10 to the eight seconds or more, uh, we just cap the, the time window we're going to be using for measurement uh, to 10 to the eight. And from there, I'm also marking the place where the optically thin limit is violated. And in this case, this is still dangerous territory because small angle scatterings are no longer uh, satisfied. Now then for these kind of uh, projections, I'm showing the constraints on, BB, on BBN. So BBN constraints tells us that vector mediators have to be heavier than 10, 10 MeV. And we also have the constraints from neutrino self-interactions and the perturbative limit on dark matter. And this gives this kind of bound. So we do see that for a large selection of dark matter masses, you still get parameter space that can be probed with this kind of approach. And it relies entirely on the fact that you have a lot of scattered events, which allows this kind of process to occur. We have the uh, cluster constraints, which was, as I mentioned before, the constraint on uh, self dark matter self-scattering cross-section divided by mass to be lower than 0.1. And it requires some assumption on the coupling of neutrino and dark matter. And depending on this assumption, this uh, cluster constraints can move either up or down. And that's what we're getting for this, uh, this model. If you start changing to the scalar mediator, you see that the picture changes dramatically. Uh, the delays are significantly larger. And this also affects the kind of uh, shape that you can get for your dark matter, ma your dark matter masses. Uh, but in even in this case, you can see that depending on your assumptions, you can also get a param parameter spaces that can still be probed uh, by, the echo, by the echo limit without coming into conflict with cluster constraints. The worst case scenario is around the MEV dark matter where you start getting clusters to start uh, getting very close to the very competitive bounds with the echo approach. 
And then finally, the case with scalar dark matter. This one is different because for, for this model, we have to assume an energy scale, which was fixed at 100 GeV. And in this, kind, in this scenario, uh, we require uh, stronger assumptions on how the dark matter coupling relates to the, to the neutrino coupling. So these kinds of small ratios are actually allowed just because our echo constraint goes so low, is actually so stringent that you can allow for dark matter self-interactions to have a very small cross-section uh, and have the neutrino coupling to still be small enough to not violate the, the constraints that we have from uh, lab constraints on the neutrino self-interaction. Juno. Oh yeah. So in the case of supernova, of supernova neutrino, of supernova neutrinos from neutrino dark matter interactions, Hyper-K, Dune, Juno, with the highest neutrino statistics, it allows us to probe parameter space that are not excluded by the other uh, measurements. And the Monte Carlo code that uh, was developed to make these sorts of analysis can be applied to several other interaction models. It can accommodate pion, muon decays, other beyond standard model processes, and hopefully the code will be available public to the public soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Yeah, I don't know what's uh, today. There must be a bug in the <laughs> power system in your place. Um, th thanks a lot. Um, are there any further questions? Maybe I, I had a question. It's more on the technical side because you, you said that you developed this Monte Carlo code. So if, if you had um, very strong scattering of these neutrinos, I mean, maybe, maybe individually, then the scattering is not so, so large, but then if this adds up, you uh, eventually lose track of the direction of the neutrinos. So you cannot really say if it's actually going to end up at Earth at all, right? How are you, how this is taken care of in, in your simulation? Okay. So at its, at its core, uh, I must, I'm starting off with the assumption that all the, uh, that I'm catching all the neutrinos in the scattering. But then uh, for each individual neutrino that is being tracked, I'm always keeping, uh, an, I can always recording the information of where's the expected arrival direction going mm -hmm. to occur. So then once this goes public, then uh, any user can always make their own, uh, their own cut on what's going the, what the arrival direction of that neutrino is going to be. Mm -hmm. to avoid um, any user losing control, uh, not having the choice of what to do mm -hmm. with, the, with the neutrinos. But the principle can also, you know, backscatter at some point, yeah? And then yes. it's, not, it's going in the wrong direction, so it's never going to appear in our telescope, right? Yes, so that's why uh, from the, from the get-go, the, the Monte Carlo code starts off by making sure that First off, you're in the very small angle scattering approximation okay. because then none of this yeah. works. Okay, okay. So it's not completely diffuse. You always assume that there is some forward. Correct. Direction. Yeah. Because okay. for the completely diffuse part, not even the the time delay formula that I presented yeah. with the integral is valid either. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, so Damiano had another question. Yes, I had a couple of questions. I can start with one. So uh, you said, of course, that there are constraints on BBN uh, on the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, so the mediator mass cannot be too um, too light. Uh, but in principle, that doesn't apply also to dark matter. In principle, with the large couplings, you can also produce dark matter with relativistic degrees of freedom. So, for example, one keV uh, dark matter wouldn't it count as relativistic degrees of freedom at BBN? Uh, one TV. One keV. So the the, oh. the values. Okay, so that's a so that's a good question. Uh, so this one now that we're getting into sub MEV dark ma dark matter, uh, we require addition additional models to try and explain this. So there is one uh, interesting reference, which is a paper by Nikita Blinov on how to generate the 
the KV dark matter. And in that case, the way you can uh, avoid, avoid the, this kind of constraint on the relativistic degrees of freedom is by, ha by having the dark, dark matter decouple at a different time than the traditional setup of uh, warm, dark, warm dark matter. And in that, in that case, you will not have the dark matter annihilation into neutrinos to further affect the, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. Uh, so the specific setup, I, I can always imagine it from off, off the top of my head, but that, that reference does, uh, does show how to make this kind of setup, setup work. Typically, it also relies on the ability of dark matter to, to generate one of these mediators and then have it subsequently decay into neutrinos at a later, at a later time. So it doesn't deposit uh, the additional entropy into the neutrinos prior to their decoupling. Yes, indeed, because the point is that, uh, um, of course, you can produce dark matter differently from freeze out and have it decoupled sooner, but you are requiring pretty large coupling. So I'm not sure. Uh, whether it's possible to have it decouple at, uh, before BBN. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then for that, so for that one, we didn't run the, uh, spe the specific test to test for, uh, for those stringent bounds as it uh, went out of, the, out, of the scope, out of the scope of the work. Uh, and in this, in this case, we're mostly trying to rely on the dark the dark matter coupling uh, being sufficiently low to allow for for this to happen so that's also why the the case of the scalar mediator in some cases can be more attractive for the for something like this to work also because in this case you're avoiding the fer the fermionic dark matter constraint where dark warm dark matter shouldn't be uh, too much heavier than a few kev Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Shashank, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, my question was about uh, the fact that uh, here an assumption is being made that the, the secret neutrino interactions only affect neutrinos and not other uh, charged leptons or quarks. Uh, so my question is how reasonable is that assumption considering the fact that once we add secret neutrino interactions in the neutrino sector, they're bound to show up in the charged lepton and the quark sector uh, through loops. So uh, did you consider whether these are compatible with uh, the observations in the charged uh, lepton and the quark sector uh, if you include loop-induced processes? Okay, so we did not, uh... Include, include these in, in assumptions. So we're based off the phenomenological approach that at, that at a tree level, the neutrino, the neutrino interactions are going to avoid outright the, char the charged particle uh, sec sector constraints. But of course, it will also be interesting to see uh, what would happen if we were to add loop corrections to some of these, because of course, uh, constraints from the charge sector could be uh, quite strong on the on whatever new interaction we're putting just because of the amount of precision you can get when making a charged sector measurement. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other further question. So let's thank uh, Jose again with a round of virtual <laughs> applause. Uh, thanks, thank you for joining us uh, today, also at, at this particular early hour for you. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we had these little hic hiccups there, but uh, it was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. everyone. <laughs>